Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Rock and Relationships webinar. I'm John Taylor. I'm an LCSW. Um, my practice is outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. I work primarily with uh, sex addicts and um, relationships post infidelity and discovery and trauma. So that's that's really what my webinar uh, presentations are, are focused on. My area of expertise is um, I like to look at relationship skills that we can utilize very early on in recovery um, because the we've been too long in a in a mode of thinking around this where relationships die on the vine because we say you've got to get healthy and you've got to get healthy and then we can work on the two of you um there are some really uh there's some really helpful behavioral changes that can happen at any stage of a relationship that make a difference and they don't even have to be your romantic relationships um these skills they they have a place in the workplace they have a place in your family relationships your relationships with your children um, even today's topic, how our family history impacts your relationships, um, believe it or not, there, there can be a place for this in the workplace, um, and there can be a place for this with your children. So we'll dive in. Um, I think it was uh, Freud who said something like, the past isn't even, in, isn't even the past. Um, and, and that's where how your family of origin relationships, how they impact you, it's along those lines. Um, even if it's been decades since you've lived with those people, um, since you've been in that home, since you, even if you are, are at a space with those relationships where you don't have a lot of contact, um, the way that our family relationships impacted us and what happened in our family of origin, it goes with us for the rest of our lives. Um, so it definitely has a big impact on how we show up in relationships. Um, and that's, that's certainly not to say that we have to have all of the heartache from our past cleared up before we can have a good relationship. Um, you can be a walking wounded person from your family of origin and have a wonderful um, primary relationship now or wonderful relationships now, even when all of that healing hasn't occurred. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about how to do that. Um, so... Um, I'm gonna, I wanna ask a question um, and you can put this in the chat feature on the side. Um, what is it from your family of, of origin that you're aware of that impacts how you show up in your relationship? So what's an issue you carry from your family of origin into your current relationships? And then the second question is along the same line, line except for, um, I want you to think about an important relationship for you and your partner in that relationship, whether that's your significant other whether that's someone at work, whether that's a sibling, a friend, are you aware of, or, or what do you know about from their family of origin history that impacts how they show up in their relationship with you? So be thinking about that. If you have an answer for that or response to that, go ahead and put it in the chat feature and we'll share some of those in, in just a minute. Um, one of the reasons why it's really important to look at family of origin issues in your relationships is because I think more reliably than almost any other factor, um, when something from our family of origin gets triggered in us, um, that is more likely to lead to an escalation in, in our relationship um, or in an argument or in an under misunderstanding or a disagreement um, because it goes so deep for us. Um, so it's really, really helpful to be able to talk about these things in any relationship you're in where it's impacting um, because it provides a roadmap, it provides some context, it provides um, some understanding of why, why this person might be getting this edge from you. However, um, to share these triggers from the past, two things need to happen. Number one, your relationship has to be safe enough in order to share that and to not have it be used as ammunition later on. So you need to have a level of trust and, and an acceptance of vulnerability with the person that you um, share that with. Um, the second thing that needs to happen is you need to be grounded enough in what that issue is so that when you open that up with another person, you don't feel completely lost or completely at their mercy. Um, you know, so for example, if, um, if neglect was a big part of my home growing up and my family of origin, and I have lived my life constructing a persona that's always competent and never in need and um, always knows how to solve a problem, it may be really hard for me to admit I was neglected and there was a time I didn't get what I needed. That may be, um, that may be too raw, too vulnerable for me to share with somebody else until I've been able to work on that and to see like I'm no longer that vulnerable. 
Um, I no longer experience abandonment because I know how to show up for myself. Um, or at the very least, I've talked to a really kind, qualified therapist who knows how to support me and hold me in that place of insecurity. Um, so when it comes to how our family of origin impacted us in relationships, make sure that you feel safe enough to share it with your partner if you're going to go there. And I'm going to talk here why you want to, why that might be helpful um, to in a relationship to explore some of those issues together. Um, so. It, it's helpful to be able to explore that because I think the more we know about somebody um, in a relationship where we're open and connected, the more empathetic we can be, the more considerate we can be, um, and the more sensitive we can be to some of their, their triggers and some of their pain. When I work with couples at any stage in the recovery process, I, I've got a couple that I'm working with right now. He doesn't necessarily have real solid recovery or, or real solid sobriety, and she's not really feeling totally safe with him. Um, but the dynamic that I've worked with them on is when he raises his voice in the home. And we've, we've talked a lot about how she grew up in a home where yelling was the preferred, preferred form of communication, especially when people were angry and people were always angry. So we have spent several sessions with her being able to tell him that story of how that felt and what was going on in that moment. And even without long-term sobriety, even without them being able to do a lot of repair in other areas of their relationship, that place is getting better because he's really able to listen to her about how much that hurt and how much that makes her afraid when it happens. And he's responding, he's changing that. And the relationship is getting a little bit safer um, in that regard. Um, so the more information we have about each other, the more sensitive we can be. And also when we're in a culture, um, whether it's in the workplace, at home, with friendships, when we're in a culture where our vulnerabilities are not liabilities, but their strengths, that's a culture where there's safety. Um, so um, when, when we can share with our partner and they can listen without judgment or attacking, um, and our partner can um, listen to us without judgment or attacking, we have a relationship where we're honoring struggle and we're honoring vulnerability. Um, and, and that's a relationship that I think has some uh, value. It has some use um, and it provides safety that a lot of other relationships don't provide. Um, it also sets the stage uh, for us to be able to, to participate in some long-term uh, repair for what those family of origin issues might be. Um, so for example, um, this weekend, my brother and I, I just have one brother who's older than me, and we both have a sister who's older than us. Her birthday was was a couple of months ago, and we, we said for her birthday, we wanted to take her out for a guy's night out. We wanted to take her out to have fun. We don't normally do stuff like this at all. Um, we've all been pretty gun shy around each other, around connecting because of our family of origin and how rough it was. Um, so we got together and she wanted to go for a hike, and we went for a hike, and then we took her to lunch. And um, we were talking for the first time um, ever about some of our individual experiences with our parents and in our family. Um, and one of the things that she mentioned to me is um, how this particular part of her story she shared with her husband a lot and how it's been one of the best things for her for some healing there um, because he doesn't have the same hangups that our parents had and that we've had as siblings. And so him knowing this story, he can help her with that. Um, I've had coworkers in the past who I've been able to open up to about some of my insecurities around putting myself out there. Um, and because they're not tied to my success or failure, they're just there for me. They've been able to be really effective um, cheerleaders, really effective supports in me putting myself out there and doing things that I, I wouldn't normally do before. Um, I, I think in large part because they know that part of my story and how hard that's been for me in the past. So when we share what's been, what's gone on in our, in our families of origin, our enduring vulnerabilities, um, we can get some really tailored help. We can have some of those corrective repair experiences. Um, somebody had put in the comments, the questions I asked, uh, what do you, what do you know about your family of or origin issues and how it might affect your relationship? Um, somebody said, my need to re be responsible achievement was valued. Um, and, and so I would imagine one of the ways that that ends up showing up in a relationship is you may be more oriented or this person may be more oriented around um, achieving and may have a hard time just being. That's important for a partner to know. 
I'm all about the to-do list. This is my story too. I'm all about the to-do list and sitting and relaxing with you may be hard for me, but when we know that and we can talk about that instead of my partner interpreting that as, oh, you don't want to spend time with me, they may be able to see that as you have a hard time slowing down. I know this about you. Like, let's get really mindful about that. Um, the second question was, what do you know about your partner's uh, family of origin that shows up in your relationship? And they put here, his single, his single parent from a non-nurturing mother, dad died, so reserved by nature. Um, and apparently my mic isn't great right now. Is it breaking up a lot? It's just doing a little bit of click. It's not as bad as last week, but I just hear those little clicks. So, so okay. you're, you're mostly good. So, okay. If it gets bad, let me know. I'll, I'll put the other mic on. Um, again, knowing this about a partner, if we know what the history is, instead of, instead of just going to the personalization, like, oh, he's not reaching out to me. We may have that story in the back of our mind that says he's not reaching out to me and that sucks. But I also know that's really hard for him. He hasn't had a lot of practice with that. So we can approach it in a different way. Um, I'm gonna share something on the screen here and then we'll get into questions. Um, let's see. Um, this comes from the research of uh, John and Julie Gottman. Um, let's see, is that sharing? Let me see a slide. Um, these are some, some areas of impact from family of origin that are shown in the research to be significant contributors to escalation in current um, relationships. Um, so something that I would encourage you to do is to look over this list and to think about a relationship that you have that is safe enough um, where you would be able to tell that person a little bit of the backstory here. Like, so uh, for example, for me, um, I'm looking at this parental conflict one um, and that is such a huge uh, map for me. That's such a huge area for me where my feelings around conflict and my feelings around um, fighting really got shaped by these continual fights between my parents that never got resolved and, and that were like, they never really made progress past that. Um, so I would take this piece and right now I am thinking of, um, I'm thinking of my spouse, that would be safe enough to share. We actually had some conflict this week where my response to her was based on this old stuff. It wasn't based on what was going on between the two of us. It was based on those habitual responses. So I need to go back to her this week and I need to remind her of that storyline for me, not as an excuse and not as a, Hey, let me off the hook, but more as a, I'm recognizing that some of what I gave you wasn't yours. And I'm recognizing that some of what I felt wasn't about our relationship um, and give her some of that context so that we have the opportunity to support each other instead of continuing a conflict. That's really not about us. Um, so the, the, concrete skill is to think of something from your family of origin that has impacted you and identify a safe relationship to, to get some practice sharing that story with. Um, kind of turning that relationship into an opportunity to heal instead of just another relationship that we're going to be triggered in. Let me see if I can get the Q&A back and still have these slides up. I can read the Q&A for you. Okay. So I am pretty sure I've worked on the issues I had with my family of origin, but I was bullied as a kid about my weight. They told me I was not good enough and my worth is what I looked like and not who I am as a person. Um, you know, this, uh, I, I really appreciate this comment here because it highlights how even when we work through stuff, we recognize that our wires got crossed in, in some degree. And, and I think anything that we've been hurt by or, or any kind of uh, baggage and during vulnerability we've, we've carried around, we're susceptible to relapse into that. And so, um, you know, for, for those of us who got messages about who we are and what's acceptable and what's not, there may be times on our worst days where we can lapse into that. You know, this person said this about me and I'm really taking that to my core. I must not be worthy. I must not be a good person. Um, and, and recognizing that there's going to be times in our life. I had a, one of my therapists explained it to me this way. Um, I was in his office bawling about what I don't remember, but I said, I thought I already resolved this. Like, I'm so mad I'm back here. 
And he kind of laughed at me and he's like, it's not a start line, finish line thing. He said, it's an orbit. And he said, you've orbited this before, but you're at a different altitude now and you're at a different closeness and this means something else now. So it's not that what you work through is not resolved. It's that you have another opportunity to look at this. Um, you have another opportunity to see where this is relevant in your life now. Um, and I think the messages we got about ourselves as kids, whether they were correct messages or incorrect messages, those are always up for review. Um, and it's important to, I think, recognize where the roots of those stories are, because then we can, if we're feeling a lot of distress around that narrative, we can start to ask ourselves, was that a situation that actually taught me the truth about myself? Or did I get something that was distorted there? Is that something I can care for myself in a better way with? Well, and I'm, I'm lots, I love this. This is really helpful. My, the one that jumped out to me was no room to express needs, um, mm -hmm. which I think it's interesting, you know, what, which you go, oh, that one. Um, yeah. I mean, there's other stuff too, um, but, but not, you know, not so much. It was, it was really that. But then I also think about, you know, my grandparents and what my parents grew up with. I mean, like there's all, you know, all these different levels and, you know, I always, I always gave them the, they're doing the best they can and they really were. Um, but you know, I, you know, you still get the baggage and to the comment, you know, I was overweight as a kid and I, you know, had that same, you know, type of thing. So it's really hard to change those messages, but also to not think that, you know, uh, like, like I, the, the scale is not my friend. I have to be super careful about that because I can immediately get into the shame messages. Like if, if it gives me a bad, and I call it bad number, therefore, you know, and I just was like, you know, I just have to not let that, you know, be part of the, you know, of the messaging, but it's so hard to rewire those things. Mm -hmm. I think the orbit thing is really a useful thing because, you know, you do, it, well, I'll speak for myself. It feels like I shouldn't have to deal with this again, or still, or whatever, and that I'm failing if I am, but I really like it that I'm, it's really, I have an opportunity to look at it from a different lens or a different perspective, mm -hmm. or, you know, or it's coming around again, like you said, there might be something that precipitated it, you know, coming to light again. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think it's really interesting how your, you and your siblings, what I found for myself was my mom is always the hub person. And so like, it, it felt like messages got funneled through her. They got, they got sieved through her too, which right. means, you know, there, there were certain things that didn't come through and her biases came through. And when I finally, my daughter kept saying, you should talk to, you know, to my sibling. And uh, she said, you have more in common than you think. My daughter, the, you know, said this. And I, you know, I finally went, I'm going to do this. And um, cause I always thought we were so different and, and to find how much we shared, we, we still approach things, you know, quite differently on lots of levels, but, the, but this is the person I have the most shared history with. I mm -hmm. mean, just bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so to find where we overlapped and how we both um, kind of dealt with the situation that was, you know, in our household was interesting and honestly brought us together. I feel closer to her, even if, you know, we don't call all the time or whatever, but I still feel more connected to her as a result of taking the being willing to reach into that vulnerability to, you know, to do that. So, um, you know, I thought it was really interesting too, when you said, look, um, vulnerabilities are not liabilities, but you know, our strengths, mm -hmm. that, you know, like we, I think as a society don't look at it that way. And so to reframe it as, you know, no, that this is, this is my vulnerability, but it's also a strength. I've also found that some of the, my, you know, st uh, my strength character, assets can also be character defects you know so, so i get you know that there's the yin and yang of those two things as well so you know i, I think that dovetails really well with this next question uh what if i do not feel emotionally safe enough to share with my, my partner when i've tried to share with my partner it has not been understood what do i do until that safety has been created and i would say find a relationship or find a group where um vulnerabilities are not liabilities that's where um, support groups um, can be really helpful, therapeutic groups, a relationship with a therapist, another person who is in your corner, be that a, um, a sibling, a friend, um, someone who is safe enough. I would say um, almost anyone who's safe enough will be a good place to go to with that because there is a lot 
especially in a relationship where addiction has really impacted it, we have a, um, we have a high conflict relationship where every interaction is a high risk. And, and keeping in mind too, that one of the hallmarks of addiction is this thought that if people knew me for who I really was, they would reject me. Um, and even if you're not the addict in that situation, um, that's a belief system that you've been in. And so it can take a while for couples to get to a point where, where both of them can hear from each other and, and really understand from each other. Like, I'm not in the market to find reasons to not be with you. Um, I actually want to find a lot of reasons for us to be connected. So um, why don't you tell me what's going on and we can connect on that. But that can take a while for, for some relationships to get there. And um, that's okay. Um, I think the relationships that end up getting there and the, the ones that end up getting there strongly are the ones where that's not forced, um, where that's not like, you've got to be this person for me and I've got to be able to tell you everything and vice versa. Um, where it's more like we really grow to value each other and we really grow to value the connection we have. It makes me think of a couple that I've worked with for about five years now. And we're finally at that point where they can say, I don't care how upset I'm going to be. Just tell me the truth. Um, tell me what's going on. Tell me what you need. Tell me what you believe. Tell me what you don't believe. Um, and in the meantime, they both had to rely on other relationships and other groups in order to have that need met. Um, and that was okay. Um, so I would say with that one, um, find some people, find some groups that you can share with and um, that you can be vulnerable with and, um, let your, let your relationship with your significant other, uh, let that one breathe a little bit on that front. I actually did a screenshot of this and I plan to, I, I'm just going to say, you know, kind, kind of what, what do you, what resonates with you? Because I think that'll be interesting because, you know, my perception of what I think, you know, for my husband may be completely different than what he would pick for himself, you know? So I think it'll be an interesting dialogue just to just go, Hey, what, what do you think? So. Yeah. There's something in the chat with the orbit thing for dealing with the past trauma. It could be that we are ready to go deeper into our psyche, that our experience can help others deal. And I, I do think that, you know, as I think we do have, I, I mean, I know that stuff that I've dealt with in the last few years, I could not have dealt with in the first couple of years. You just talked about the client that's, you know, hanging around for five years. You could not have started out, you know, five years ago with them with the stuff that yep. you're able to deal with now. So I do think that we do, you know, do some healing and repair and get so that we're able to take that in more. You know, I, I had a mentor several years ago and um, in in all of the help that she gave me, it was always infused with gardening metaphors because that was her life. And um, one time she was, she was talking to me about um, manure and how important that is to growth. And she said, you know, you take something that at first glance is a blight on your property and you put it out in the sun, you let it dry out, you mix it with some, some good soil and you get some worms in there. And all of a sudden that pile of crap has become fertilizer. And um, she really drove the point home that um, the thing that may have hurt me back then, it could still be valuable to, to not necessarily carry around, but it, it could still serve some value for me because given the right conditions, it can actually turn into something that's really catalytic for growth. Um, it can turn into something that's actually really nourishing. Um, and, and I think that's a really, really big part of, remembering what our family of origin stuff is not so that we're always in pain um but because um sometimes what we didn't get or what hurt us can become one of the best parts of our life like i look at um i look at this not being known in the family the first one on my list here um and that is something that i don't know if you ask my kids, they might think different later on, but I don't know that they're going to have the same experience that I had there because of what I went through, um, because of what I recognize from that. Um, I, I think they get, they get a much more dialed in relationship with me than I got with my parents. And it's because of that, that pain that I carry around. It's because of what didn't work for me. Oh, I think that's really true. I, I think for those of us that try to do things differently, you know, because we're looking at this, you know, you talked about your, 
you know, you, you're working with a therapist. So it's one of those things where we are being intentional about doing things differently and not mm-hmm. just continuing to repeat the pattern. So mm-hmm. uh, there's a question growing up with a narcissist father and an overwhelmed codependent mother, I learned to shut down, dissociate and ignore my feelings and needs very early on. I'm working on it, but living with my husband in early SA recovery makes it really difficult to make progress. I don't feel safe expressing my feelings and needs. I hope I'll feel safe being vulnerable with him in the future, but I'm not sure what to do in the meantime. You know, my, my mind goes on this to, um, it's kind of what, what could have been thoughts, um, but not necessarily the kind that we get lost in, but more like think about what difference it would have made if, um, so with, with this father and mother that were described, what difference do you think it would have made if at that age or when that was going on, you were able to give them direct feedback about wasn't work, what wasn't working. And eventually they were able to hear that feedback and make some changes. Um, I, I think those kind of things that kind of like, let me tell you about what this is like for me. Let me tell you what I need from you. Um, that can be really, really powerful. Um, there's a, there's a client that I work with who was in a very, very similar situation. And, um, she had a she had a conversation with a significant other one day where she said, I need a lot of care and I need a lot of affection. I need a lot of attention. And I know you're not able to give that to me right now. And so she said something to him like, you've got three months. I'm going to give you a three month break from those kind of like fr- from me coming to you with my need there. At the end of that three months, I'm going to reevaluate that. But I want you to know I'm giving you this space and time so that you don't have to feel like you're failing me and everybody else mm. um and but the end of that three months she came back and no miracles had happened he wasn't all of a sudden really great at attending to her needs and all of that but a year down the road where we're at now she's now going through some really tough times and she's not able to be there for him um and he's saying to her you gave me that time i can do the same for you like i'm just here for you i'm just going to support you and um for her, that was a big piece of advocacy to be able to go to her um, her important other and to say, hey, here's what I need and here's what I'm recognizing and this is what I'll accept. And that was able to sink in at some point and, and be able to make a difference. So when you ask like, what do I do in the meantime? Um, I think being able to give the degree of feedback that your partner might be open to around like, I know you're not able to do this now, but if I could just tell you like, this is what it's feeling, that's, that's a good place to go in the short term. Um, again, I think making sure that you have the kind of support that you need, um, because it often does take our, our significant other who's struggling with sex addiction, it does take some time for them to be able to be empathetic. It does take some time for them to be able to have an emotional bandwidth. Um, what I've seen in relationships is when that stepping back is really um, intentional. Hey, let me tell you what I'm doing right now, what's gonna be changing right now, because I wanna be able to have a safe, connected relationship with you. And I know that you're not able to hit that target all the time. So I'm, I'm gonna stop shooting, or I'm gonna stop putting up that target for you to hit for now. Um, and let's, let's revisit this later. Um, because I, I think the whole, again, in the past, and and oftentimes what that scared part of us will say is, it's got to be extremes, either we're extremely connected, or we have nothing. And there really is, um, I think in a lot of cases, there really is a middle ground, we may not be able to be real emotionally safe with each other, but it may be we have fun when we play. So we might put our effort into connecting on what's working, and being really aware of what's not working, so that we can we can continue to work on the parts of the relationship that are strong and not full of hurt for us. And we can get the timing right for when it's time to push into what is gonna be more difficult or what's gonna require a little bit more from us. I think that's really helpful. And I, you know, you've done a webinar before on, you know, being able to look at things and it's not that everything's bad. There's just areas where you go, well, you're doing this really well, but this this is not something. I think what a gift for 
both really both members of the couple ship to you know to have the gift of we're going to take this stress off of our relationship right now i i have needs they're they're not going to be met you can't meet them right now i'm voicing them so i'm holding that space but you know to to you know give the relationship some space to heal is and, you know, I, I think it was really, you know, really great of her and, you know, for them. I, and clearly, you know, if he's able to can turn it back around for her, you know, there is some growth in that area too. That's good. It was a very long-term investment. And she would, during that, like between when she said that and now she would often wonder, like, I don't know if he recognizes what that was. And it turns out he did. Um, and right. he was able to give that back in a really, um, a really meaningful way. So, you know, back to the gardening analogy, sometimes it takes seeds a while to germinate and start growing, but planting those is usually a good idea. So uh, there's a question. I'm wondering about your thoughts on TV programming with nudity and partners feeling safe watching with the porn addict in the recovery. My PA husband is sober and working on his recovery six months in. He is frustrated that we are the only people not watching these Netflix shows due to the nudity. He told me that he wants to be a guy and be able to watch guy movies and guy shows. And with that comes violence and some nudity. Mm -hmm. He feels controlled by me if he can't watch them. I've told him it's not control. I'm just asking him to be sensitive to my trauma. Thoughts? Yeah, so so first I'm going to go with my reaction on that and then I'll be I'll be therapeutic. Uh -huh. um, I don't know where my manhood got defined um, by a woman's body parts and my ability to see those or not. Um, so, you know, that... <laughs> I get the thumbs up from Tammy. Yeah. That, that line around this is part of being a guy... Um, to, to me, that's, that's a bit of an immature stance on that. Um, and uh, so that, that's reaction number one. Um, the piece about kind of like, wh what are my thoughts on the, the triggering nature of that? So I've seen with couples in long-term recovery, um, sometimes they can go to entertainment forms that might be more triggering or, or might include more nudity or even overt you know, sexual themes. Um, but the way they're able to go there is they have a long track record of we can talk about what this is and we can talk about what, what this means for both of us. Um, to say that violence and sex are just a guy thing, um, I don't know that that's true. I know a lot of women who really like action movies and um, really like to be titillated. Um, I think being able to do that safely with somebody else requires a lot of communication. And at this stage in recovery, you guys may not be there. And that may be that may be part of the underlying thing here is is it may not be I'm just always triggered by this and I can't do this. It's I don't know where your mind is at with this. You don't give me the transparency and you don't give me the the vulnerability and and we haven't even developed the ability to really talk about sex in the way that we need to in order for that to be completely safe and for us to to have a life uh, built together around that. Um, so I, I have worked with a lot of couples where it is really, really frustrating for both parties. Like when our friends start talking about TV shows or they start talking about movies, we're like, well, we haven't watched that because we're healing from addiction. It's not what you're going to say to them. So it, it can be really frustrating. But for me, the thing to look for in the relationship or the skill to build is those abilities to have those intimate conversations about what does this mean for you? And how is this affecting you? Um, what's the value you find in this? Because um, whether it's like nudity and sex and violence, or whether it's um, the music you listen to, that's the opportunity for connection. I, I think of the music that, I, that you listen to with a smile, because when I was first dating my wife, um, my favorite band um, was and is the White Stripes. I don't know if there's any other fans out there. Um, but uh, I remember going to pick her up for a date and um, I had one of their albums on because like this music makes me feel good. So of course I'm going to go listen to it on the way to a date. So we get in the car and it's playing and she does this big like, Ugh. <laughs> and um, she's like, I hate it when this stuff's on the radio. And I was like, well, that's not the radio. Like that's my CD player. And um, she's like, you really like these guys. She's never had a problem being direct with me. And I said, I love them. Like, it's my favorite music. And um, I just think so much of their music is stupid. Uh, and then she said, but if you feel this way about it, I'm willing to give it another chance. 
and she actually um <laughs> come to find out she had a boyfriend before me that was really into the white stripes and he didn't treat her very well but he'd given her a bunch of albums um that I didn't have and so she was like you might be interested in these and we actually like the white stripes now play in our house often and it's something that we both like um because we had a lot of conversations around the story behind that for us and I understood where she was coming from and it wasn't a deal breaker for me that that wasn't her favorite music and she was able to open enough about enough bandwidth for me where she didn't cast me in the same light as that other idiot. Um, and so we were able to talk about what it meant for us and it became a bonding thing. And for a lot of couples in recovery, um, sexual material or suggestive material can become that, but there's a whole lot of relationship healing that has to happen before. And I would imagine for you, it doesn't help that his response is defensive and impatient right now. Um, that may not feel like there's a lot of room for you to have the feelings that you need to have and have the process that you need to have. And that would be some of that feedback that might be helpful. Um, for, for most people that I work with, they don't want a never ever in my life will I ever go here again. They want to get back to normal too, people who have been betrayed. Um, it, it, it's a lot of matter of the timing and the setting and the person who I'm going to go there with that either makes that feel safe or not. So she continues, is it normal for me, the partner, to feel uncomfortable and triggered when watching these shows with my husband? I agree our communication is not safe or full around this. Yes, it's completely normal to feel triggered there. Um, because the as, as I've worked with, with partners of, of porn addicts, um, the biggest spot of uncertainty for them is not necessarily you've been watching this. It's, I don't know what I don't know what this means for you and I don't know what's going on in your head. So if you're sitting there right next to him and let's say there's nudity or sex scene on the screen, the reason why that's triggering is because I, I know what you're seeing. I'm seeing it too. I don't know what this means for you. Are you going to spin off into relapse after this? Are you looking at this on the screen and thinking, wow, I want her a lot more than I want my spouse. Um, so it's really that unknown. And I would say that unknown what's happening with my addicted partner and what are they feeling and thinking Again, it doesn't just have to be violence and sex and nudity that trigger that. There's a whole lot of that when I don't know what's going on in your head, I'm going to be triggered because there was there was this significant thing going on in your head in your life for a really long time and it impacted me and I knew nothing about it. So you're not a crazy person for being triggered in that way. And I was thinking kind of like how you kicked it off too is my, my first reaction was, you know, I had some major sinus surgery and I got the baby drugs. It was like the weakest form of any kind of pain relief. And I thought I gave up my right to have the good stuff, you know, because, you know, I clearly can't be trusted yeah. with them. So, so to me, it's, it's not a right um, that I get to do this guy stuff. I love what you shared about, you know, your man card, like who, who defines all of the, this type of thing. Um, but I, um, I, you know, I was really thinking six months is great, but six months is early. I, you know, that's really so early in recovery. So, you know, it is still very much in the trust building stage and he's got a long ways to go because clearly you're not feeling like you can completely trust him. So, you know, Dr. Rob on, on the webinars, we talk about, you know, it's 18 months of, you know, not, you know, uh, of doing what you need to do and not having a relapse, you know, and if there's a relapse or there's something, you know, it can reset the clock, but it, you know, it takes about that long for a partner to go. I honestly think, you know, the, the addict is making progress and, you know, I see how the dots connect and, you know, I think that there's hope for all of this. And, you know, so, so eight, six months is really early. I would invite you to use some of the tools that you're hearing, you know, on, on here to um, have some conversations. If you haven't read out of the doghouse, if he hasn't read out of the doghouse yet, it's, it talks about mm -hmm. rebuilding trust and mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's doing what you say. Um, but there's, there's lots of very manly movies that don't have sex. Go watch the John Wayne movies for goodness sakes, you know, who never a more manly man than John Wayne. And there just isn't, there's romance, but there's not sex in them. So, yeah. So, um, so another comment, the problem is if the father was truly a narcissist, it wouldn't matter if you actually understood how his behavior was hurtful, nothing would change because he would blame her for how he treated her. Oh my goodness. That's my husband. So, 
and and I would agree the the reason why we stand up for ourselves is not I, w- I would say it's like the tertiary reason to make a difference in somebody else the primary reason is to claim our right to have a voice and claim our right to have needs um, and in order to get that, that job done nobody has to change in response um, I have to be able to voice it I have to be able to stand by what I say but that's it um, and and that's really like when it comes to that my background is you know, my father's narcissistic and my mother wasn't there for me and, and things like that. Um, kids in that situation learn to not have a voice um, because they tell themselves it doesn't do any good. Um, children don't have a robust internal life, meaning they can track, oh, how did that make me feel? Or what did I do that, that contributed to that? It's very much, was there, a con- was there a desirable consequence to my actions outside of me? But as adults, we can certainly do that. Like, you know, I know this didn't make a difference, but I wanted to say something anyway. Um, and, and that's really, I think, where that updated skill is, is even if you say it the right way or, or the perfect way, it, yeah, it may not spark a change, but how is that going to feel for you to say, I didn't, I, I didn't swallow my own voice again? Um, that's where a lot of healing happens. And I think uh, just in, um, first of all, you have to be able to identify what you're going to say, you know, so so you have to be able to articulate that in, I have to own it, you know, I I have to be able to own that this is, you know, this is what happened, or this is how this affected me or whatever. So I think, you know, and just having, um, having that, like you said, without any expectation that anything else changes, you know, and, and People may be de- deceased, but just owning that this is what happened, um, mm-hmm. you know, I think is empowering for, you know, from the standpoint is, you know, I'm owning that this is, this is how I was affected by things outside of me. Now, what I choose to do with that, you know, like in, now in this present moment, you know, I like what you're talking about with your wife and um, going like, I need to go back and reframe um, uh, that, that, you know, oh, this is what was happening for me in the moment. You know, I think that that's really powerful. Mm-hmm. Other, Any questions? other questions? Comments? Good stuff. This is always really, you know, and I got to tell you, uh, I think you've got a real keeper with your wife because I mean, I just am so impressed with, you know, like every, everything you've, um, you know, like that you're willing to be vulnerable with each other and everything. I appreciate you sharing that stuff. We have said to each other for a really, really long time. Um, we can't chalk it up to anything else. We were very lucky to find each other at the time that we did. Um, and really lucky to have that, like, one of her first impressions from seeing how my family really, really worked was she said, we're not going to be one of those couples that just hates each other and doesn't say anything about it. Yeah. And, um, she's been relentless around that, which has been a really good thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree. I've, I've gotten lucky and we've worked hard to maintain it. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's what, exactly what it takes is, uh, you know, being willing to do the work and, and valuing that the relationship is worth it. You know, yeah. we talk about that all the time. It's like, we're so much better together, you know, as a, you know, facing the world, if, if we're in a healthy relationship, but understanding that and not just going well, but I want, or I deserve or whatever. Mm-hmm. It, it's kind of like, that was, you know, I want to watch the, you know, the, these, popular things on Netflix. Well, or do I really want a great relationship with my wife? You know, it's really comes down to that kind of, you know, I can either do things that make her feel safe and, and do that. So, um, uh, Eddie Caparucci has a, um, has done a couple webinars and it, and it talks about safety for partners and stuff too. You may want to, to watch those. All of the previously recorded webinars are, uh, including, John has done a great job on relationship things and, you know, the very practical tools. So on uh, sexandrelationshiphealing.com under resources, you'll see previously recorded webinars. And I'd invite you to do that. I'd also, you know, for this particular couple, consider the couples workshop uh, that is offered at Seeking Integrity Los Angeles. It really helps. The goals are posted on seekingintegrity.com for the workshop, but it really talks about, you know, communication skills and finding safety and, you know, all of those types of things. Um, uh, with six months of recovery, that's a really good time for you to consider that. I mean, there's lots of good times, but, you know, for that particular, you know, you've got some history behind you, but you're also at kind of this, you know, uh, 
Um, and I think uh, you find it really uh, helpful. So um, there's, uh, I want to thank you for your advice last week. You recommended that I advocate for myself and my needs surrounding my husband's treatment. I did. And while I'm not sure what the outcome will be, but it's very empowering just being able to speak up for myself. So thank you. It's kind of like you were just talking about. Yep. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Um, your voice doesn't have to make a difference for it to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause yes, you spoke up for yourself. Yep. Great. So. Okay, well, we will see you next week. So okay. same, same place, same time. So. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.